Welcome, my dear ones. This is Tracy Anderson Askew, your host for the Transform Your Birth podcast, changing your mind about birth one story at a time. Each week, we'll be exploring a birth story through the lens of what birth can teach us. I'll be digging deep into each story so you can learn what it is that can change the way a birth unfolds. We can't control birth, but we can influence it. So listen in to find out how. Enjoy. I loved recording this episode as we started to venture into the realm of birth that is often not discussed. What is going on for women at a deeper level when they go through the process of giving birth? Jen's first birth started with an induction, and although it was intense, she loved it. During her second pregnancy, she was healthy and well and was able to experience labour and birth very differently, under the steam of her own oxytocin. She discovered this well of hormones had much to offer, and she helps us to explore why physiological birth must be honoured and strived for, as the benefits to the mother and baby are immense and help them to travel the path beyond. Whilst this is a slightly longer episode, it really is well worth the listen. So enjoy the wisdom from this conversation. Hello everyone, another week with the Transform Your Birth podcast and with me today is the lovely Jennifer and she's going to be sharing with us her story of two births and when I was talking to Jen before we have gone on record here, Um, She shared an interesting insight and reflection she's been having about her early life as a child and what happened and and she can actually draw a line between those experiences to her birth experiences. So I'm going to welcome Jen. Hello, darling. Thank you. Hello. Thanks so much for having me. (laughs) So tell us what happened um, when you were 11 years old and then help us to understand how you think that might have influenced your birth. Um, so I've been reflecting lately, my births were, um, over a year ago and then two and a half years before that. But recently I've been reflecting how much my experience of childhood cancer when I was 11 really carried through to how I behaved in the hospital and how I suppose, how I think my births unfolded in the hospital setting. Cause I feel like I had quite a positive experience, um, but I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when I was 11, wow. um, which was quite a treatable cancer even then in 1996, um, kind of the second most curable after leukemia. Um, but my treatment was really, really intense and I got extremely sick. And the longest I spent in hospital was uh, two months straight. Um, and yeah, I couldn't eat and I couldn't talk and I <laughs> couldn't walk and um wow. I was very very ill um but I was fully cured and um really as a like then you know becoming a 12 year old wanted to just get on with like there was heaps going on I was finishing primary school I was moving into high school I wanted to get back to my dancing and I didn't I think reflect on it too much I was just glad to be done mm. um but yeah I've been noticing really how comfortable I was in hospital compared to a lot of people because I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and people yeah. saying you know being in hospital itself can affect your birth mm, absolutely um, yeah, it's a foreign, feel... yeah it's a foreign environment for a lot of women and it does disturb birth people don't realize um that just even going to hospital is going to influence the way your labour unfolds. And, of course, then we bring to the hospital whatever baggage we have around Mm. the medical system. My family are chronic for having white coat syndrome. That's what we call it, is every time you go to see the doctor, your blood pressure goes up. (laughs) So different women have different responses to it. So what what you're saying there sounds like as a child you learnt to be comfortable in that environment, you were well cared for, and it felt, familiar to you is that what you're saying yeah it does bring me some comfort um to know that I'm around professionals but I think it did make me a bit more passive and certainly throughout my pregnancy um the the chemo affected my fertility so I was always told I would need to have kids uh kind of late 20s rather than late 30s and I ended up having them essentially mid 30s um and I had 
since I was a teenager, seen a post oncology fertility specialist. Right. Um, frozen eggs. And I had expected to have a long and brutal journey to get pregnant. And I didn't. Wow. And, yeah. The doctors said, when you're ready to use your eggs, um, try for one or two months and then come and see me. Mm-hmm. So they were just, in my mind, token attempts before mm-hmm. I had an appointment already booked. And uh, the day before the appointment, my period didn't come as it normally would. Like it, I had some bleeding, but it wasn't my normal routine, which was very regular. Mm-hmm. Um, and I took a test and it was positive. Oh, well done. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't believe it. And it actually uh. made me really, really anxious throughout my entire pregnancy. Oh. which I didn't properly understand until afterwards. Yeah, now that's interesting. So you were pregnant with your first baby. You surprised yourself by not needing fertility treatment mm-hmm. after your childhood um, cancer. So how were you feeling then when you came into the idea of, okay, I've got to prepare to give birth. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? Um. Well. I was, yeah, kind of passive in the in the process, like because I had expected to have trouble conceiving or not be able to conceive at all, yeah. I'd been really hesitant to learn anything about pregnancy or birth. Um, so for a person who was very keen to have kids, I knew nothing kind of deliberately to, I guess, protect myself. Yeah, um, okay. And... A nice, decent dose of denial, darling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what um, I don't yeah. know won't hurt me. <laughs> yeah. Then when I when I was pregnant, yeah. I had an app that, t- you know, told me like each day it gave me some tidbit of information about the kind of stage that I'm at of the yeah. pregnancy. And I would read that thing five times a day because I was desperate for information. But I didn't know about this whole world of information that's out there, like podcasts and other people's birth stories and Like there is so much you could Mm. read and learn and listen to. Um, But I didn't know that I was out there and I I didn't really feel like in in amongst work and doctor's appointments and things that I had the time to really dive into it. Okay. Um, And so, yeah, I kind of. But you did end up doing some preparation, didn't you? Yeah, I did. When so I when I saw convinced. the fertility doctor that mm-hmm. day after the test, she ran a test to confirm that I was pregnant, the blood test, um, and she recommended an obstetrician in Canberra. So I went off to that obstetrician without really considering what um, model of care that I wanted. Mm-hmm. I didn't think about whether I wanted to go through the public hospital or um, try to have continuity of care through a birth centre. I didn't even know what that was. Yeah. Um, I really just, she gave me a recommendation. I got the referral. I went. And then that obstetrician was attached to a private hospital. So that was my hospital. And I did the tour there and met the midwives and did some birth, like preparatory classes at the hospital that were more focused on breastfeeding and kind of the medical options that you have during birth about um, what happens if you are induced and Um, what happens if you want an epidural and Mm. um, kind of explaining those which is really important Um, but there was nothing really about preparing your mind for birth yeah no that is the missing link a lot of the time and I think what you're describing there is quite common is we tend to be led in those early days when we're pregnant for the first time because we don't know the system we don't Mm. tend to and people don't tend to talk about options of care and what that then actually results in what you're actually signing up for when you go Mm. through that process and different models suit different people but ultimately it's where women feel safe that's the most important thing but it's also where women can communicate their needs feel heard feel respected in their care these are all very important things to look for and then when it comes to doing the hospital classes it's very common feedback that I get that they focus on what they need you to know to use their service. Mm -hmm. So if they offer you an epidural, you've been informed and things like that, but they don't help women to understand the how to go about dealing with whatever unfolds on the day. So they're not giving you many tools or skills 
other than medical options. And the biggest missing link in the whole process is the mind. Exactly what you've described is that we just don't realize that birth more than anything is a mental and an emotional journey as much as it is a physiological journey because you can't separate the physiology from the emotions it's mm -hmm. all interconnected and how we think will influence how our body responds to birth so when you did those classes you got a sense of hang on there's something missing here yeah and my friend uh who had had her babies a little before me had done calm birth in Sydney or right. in Barrel and she recommended it um and yeah. she said that it was particularly helpful for her partner to feel like he had a role and feel more engaged and, I guess, prepared. Yeah. Um, and I really wanted that for my partner too and, um, <laughs> and for myself because, to me, birth was a black box. Like you mm. go in there for 12 to 24 to whatever, 48 hours, who knows what happens, and then at the end you have a baby. That's yeah. what it was to me. And so when we did the course, um it really filled in the blanks and that helped me so much to, I know like the stages of labour, um, I guess sometimes contested in terms of how long they are, what they actually are and that kind of thing. But to me having some, what do you call it, like signposts um, yeah. about like here's where you're at, some landmarks, um, really, really helped that I knew like my contractions would be, you know, potentially this far apart and, feel like this and then they would become more intense and then yeah. I'd be in transition and then I'd be pushing and yeah. maybe there were you know some extra stages or maybe I skipped through some of them a little but no having those signposts to, mm -hmm. for me to know where I was at just helped me so much yeah in preparation and in the in the moment yeah that that's powerful knowledge is power understanding what's ahead and and what to expect for both you and your partner your partner being able to read the situation too makes such a big difference mm -hmm. so when you look at where you were at and then doing the hospital classes doing then the calm birth classes here in Canberra um with our organization when we were calm birth and then you needed to do the practices now you told me earlier that the practices made a big difference what what was that like after doing the course and then what did you notice well um one thing I noticed is when I went <laughs> when I went on maternity leave um where I work they require you to leave six months six, sorry six weeks before your due date unless right. your doctor says it's okay for you to continue um I was like, I'm out of here. I'm so tired. I had preeclampsia uh -huh. and I didn't realize until my second pregnancy where I didn't have preeclampsia, how much that affected mm. me and made me actually feel unwell. Mm. Um, but I was desperate to finish work. I was so tired. I like, I found it, I was finding it very hard and people would say to me, oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do for six weeks? And to me, that is the beginning of the devaluing of women's work yeah, yeah like yeah. if you want to know what I'll be doing I'll be expressing colostrum I'll be doing perineal massage I'll be learning about labor and doing the preparation that I need to do to safely deliver a baby mm. and you know and how growing to, a baby avoid trauma in the process mm. yeah wow <laughs> I actually found it really insulting but also it felt inappropriate to talk about my perineum with my colleagues or yeah. talk about my nipples when I <laughs> expressing the first time I thought nah I've had these boobs a long time mm. I know what they can do and they don't have anything inside them but voila they did <laughs> <laughs> nesting is such an under um so nesting is that last part of the pregnancy and we think nesting is about cleaning things we normally wouldn't clean. It's so much more than that. It's bringing mm. you into a state of birth readiness and it's where women just lose their care factor for things they might have loved. You might have loved your work and then all mm. of a sudden it's like, oh, I am I just don't care about this anymore. But what's actually happening is she's getting ready to be the mother and there's a lot of transformational forces going on inside of you that are preparing you for this massive upgrade this intense experience of giving birth and then of course being ready to welcome a baby and attend to a very you know a baby mm -hmm. 
newborn baby has really high needs. So that la- those last few weeks to help women build up their their um, energy levels and prepare, like you really owned your preparation and said, "Yeah, this is work. This is I'm mm. doing the job of motherhood right now." And you absolutely are. I love how you've brought that out. Um, and yeah, I did I did the meditations a lot mm. um, because it felt to me like study. Like when we're, we're not just going off for to have our tonsils removed and mm. then three days later you're recovered your brain is going through yeah. big permanent changes like you are changing as a person which I've learned through like now through listening to like a lot of yeah, yeah. different things I'm so just obsessed with birth now um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah you're you're really um undergoing a momentous change like, like puberty you know you come out the other side and you are different to how you were um and yeah I treated it not like an exam but like uh you know the big change that it is and I really felt like I studied for birth I read all I read the book that we had received at calm birth and just read those birth stories and I really wanted to kind of give a shout out to one one colleague um who said to me I found birth really good and she was the only one most people said like oh yeah that was hard I'm glad it's over but you know you just got to go through it but she said I really liked it it was yeah it was good and I just grasped onto that and in addition to reading the other birth stories yeah um just totally changed my perspective and so I found that to be really valuable preparation reading the birth stories and listening to the meditations particularly the sleep one because as I mentioned, I was super anxious. I was just convinced that mm. my pregnancy couldn't, could not, um, you know, last. Um, so I was really, really struggling to sleep and was mm. very stressed right until he was on my chest. Mm. Yeah, out. people love love that sleep track that I did. It's um, mm. it's powerful. So tell us about your first birth. How did it unfold? Okay, so my preeclampsia kind of um so when you say preeclampsia you didn't have full-blown preeclampsia or they would have induced you a lot earlier you did you have signs of preeclampsia I just wanted to my blood pressure was going up right and my platelets were coming down but slowly and my doctor said essentially we'll monitor this because at some point it you know it's going slowly up um at a you know small gradient and it may suddenly peak um and get bad and she asked me to look out for liver pain. <laughs> like, I didn't know where my liver was. Um, but she had said, you know, pointed to my right side of my body and yeah. um, said, just, you know, let us know if you have any pain here. And one night after dinner, I was 37 and three, I would guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and after dinner, I thought I had indigestion because, man, I just immediately had pain. I was sitting on the couch. I couldn't sit on the couch anymore. I was standing up and... I couldn't fall asleep like the pain just persisted and when I I did drift off when I woke up at three the pain was exactly the same like it hadn't changed at all so I thought it's not digestion um so I called the birth suite at the hospital or delivery suite and they said come in and we'll do a trace I'd had quite a lot of traces because I had thought there was a change in his movement yeah um so over the preceding weeks, I had a few traces. So yeah, happy to go in. We went in in the middle of the night and were, um, everything was fine, but they did a follow-up blood test. I'd had one coincidentally the day before, you know, the day that I started to experience this pain. But so then, you know, less than 24 hours later, I had a, another blood test just to check if anything had changed. Mm-hmm. And the doctor who was on call, the obstetrician on call, because mine was away, which I didn't know. Um, she, he said, I'll call you if there's any, any problem. And so we went home, I went to bed and woke up at about midday with no missed call. So I thought, okay, we're all good. Um, but then he called and said that my, some level um, in my liver had gone from, I don't remember now, but it was like, say it had been 300 and now it was 1200 or something. Right. So um, yeah. It was a dramatic change, and he said, "Your liver's inflamed, and um, you need you're going to have your baby today. So come on in." Um, 
and it was a weekend um and he asked me to come to I was going to be birthing at um Calvary John James yeah um and he'd said come to Calvary Bruce um he said because it was less busy and closer to where I live but um I also think it was probably because they have surgical staff there on the weekends whereas the other hospital would have had to call them in um just in case it went badly I guess or needed needed cesarean or whatever um so I was birthing yeah on a different day with a different doctor in a different hospital wow and I was a bit disoriented like a bit disappointed I guess um but also I was just as I mentioned very stressed about this baby and was like okay if that's what we're doing let's go do it and in my diary I've written that I was really excited so I say that I was really stressed but I think I was really excited also yeah um, to have the baby like this is something I've wanted for so so long <laughs> yeah so and I felt really um prepared like the night it was the day before that I'd finished you know like finished my nesting I finished the baby's room the bags were packed <laughs> they were sitting in the cot ready to go like you were ready I'd cooked my whatever I was going to eat after birth and like everything was done I'd made my pads that and they were in the freezer <laughs> <laughs> I'd done all the things that you I were ready to do. yeah um, so, so that would have been a big thing to adjust to though did you have a bit of an emotional meltdown what did you anchor yourself to to kind of maybe it was just the baby the fact that well, you were going to meet your baby yeah I wrote in my diary that I was surprisingly mm-hmm. calm I read it I reread it yeah. just before our chat um and I called my mom and I called my partner um because they were both both going to come with me and yeah. I think like partly my mom I know she wanted to be there but also to me like hospital is with my mom because yeah. that's another right. cancer thing like she was always the one yeah. who slept over in the room with me and um yeah that's just like my comfort I guess mm. um so they were both like oh well, uh, and I was like it's okay we just have to go um so let's get our stuff and we'll go and yeah I was just really calm and kind of focused but that's that's how I roll anyway like if something stressful happens I'm mm. often a person to say it's all right I'll just deal with it um so yeah I really wasn't I wasn't too bothered do you but think I know that a lot came of from, your, from being 11 and having to deal with what you, because that's a beautiful quality to have is the ability to be calm in the chaos and the ability to roll with what is and not mm. fight against the acceptance of what is unfolding in our lives. I mean, we, we can all have little hissy fits and carry on when we don't get the car park we want. I mean, <laughs> you're talking about big stuff here. Well, do do you think that was related to what you had to adapt to as a child? Because children are very adaptable generally. Definitely, definitely. Mm. Like my chemo had, oh, like so many side effects, so many horror stories that I won't, yeah, I won't, um, you know, go into. But there were just a lot of things that happen, kind of like in early parenthood, where things get so messy, and you're just like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, the baby's weed on itself. And on me, just while I was doing nappy change, I need to change like everything and clean the carpet. And yeah, yeah. all right, like, would, okay, let's just do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Kind of like that. These um, are wonderful skills to have, people. The ability <laughs> to roll with life and what is, especially yeah. in the chaos, especially when there's urine going everywhere and but shit I happening. Think, and... I think I learned in hospital that you just have to do what you have to do. And chemo is awful because you have to make yourself sick in order to get better. Right. And that's a really tough like thing for a child to comprehend and to accept like you have to go back to hospital you feel fine now but you have to go in and get sick so that you don't die um it's really intense and so to me um my adjustment was that oh this pregnancy and this engagement with doctors and hospitals is positive Mm. and I found that really hard because I found myself getting stressed when I was going to my obstetrician appointments and Mm. I thought no you're like everything's good you're Mm -hmm. continuing to go to these appointments because you're pregnant that's awesome and you're continuing to go because you're progressing through the pregnancy and everything's fine um and now I get to go to hospital to have this baby um to get you know this person in my life that I really really want 
not for something bad, not because I'm ill, although I was a bit ill. With them. That's such a powerful mindset, Jen. That's mm. that's incredible. And I think for people listening to this, this is part of the journey that you're on. You are upgrading your capacity to cope with more. That's what the mother is. The mother is a bigger version of the woman. And we we can't control everything. And you certainly learn that when you're a parent. You, we can influence and we exercise our capacity to influence our agency. But really, ultimately, we've just got to get on board with what is mm. and do our best. So, wow, well, that's that's so interesting. So what unfolded when you got to hospital? Well, yeah, it was very much suspending my expectations. Like I was trying to think, you know, you know, you want to plan your birth, but you can't, you don't know what's going to happen. And so it was just this really weird floating sensation where I was like, you know, you're going to go through this process, but don't worry about the detail. It's what's going to happen is going to happen. And I was really deliberately, I felt like I was lifting myself up out of my brain um, to go like, don't worry about it. Just, you know, each thing will come as it comes. And I'd done some prenatal yoga and we um, kind of had a result that we, uh, you know, made up and we did during the yoga nidra meditation where you're kind of you know, basically falling asleep, but maybe you're a little conscious as well. And you're thinking about this positive result. And mine was, um, I've got the words, but I won't bother finding them. It was very much just about like, I trust that I will make the right decision at the time. Wow. Um, yeah. And yeah, I really lent into that. <laughs> it's just like, go with the flow. Yeah. Um, Your body responds to the words and images you give it. And if you don't consciously choose the words and images, the things that are going to help you, you might default to an old pattern. So having an affirmation like that is so much more powerful than, oh my goodness, what, who's this? I don't know this person. What's going to happen next? But and, and, and like a statement like that is going to completely, if you really lean into it, like you're describing, it's going to completely transform your experience of what's happening. So that was a good anchor, what you're describing there. Yeah. And I had really wanted to experience, just because I think from my mom's stories, I really wanted to experience going into labor um, as a surprise, you know, like, oh, my water's broken, I'm in labor. But I had to go in and I had to be induced and have my waters broken and all of that. So um, you know, overall, I didn't care because I was having my baby. Um, but that the induction was a big change of pace. Like when I'd learned about it at the hospital, I didn't really want to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to be up and moving around as we learned in the course. Um, I didn't want to be tethered to a drip and a monitor, like the heart rate monitor. Yeah. And I was on fluids too, because I'd had that weird night where I just hadn't eaten Mm. I haven't eaten for basically a whole day. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, so, ooh, I don't know. Where do you want me to go from here? <laughs> so like tell it a lot of, of people. Story. Yeah, well, uh, I'm I'm keen to get into your second story as well. So we, we will move through this. But um, a lot of people have aversions to inductions and for good reasons because they do change the trajectory of a birth and they do tend to be very intense. How were you able to manage that? Um, well, mine was very intense. Mm -hmm. And um, the syntocinum yep. um, started yep. and I started feeling kind of period pain cramps and I was leaning, I was standing up and leaning over the bed when the contraction came and I was like, okay, great, things are going. That's really good. I'm glad about that. Um, but after kind of a short time, about an hour and a half, my legs were shaking and I was exhausted and I felt like I couldn't stand anymore. And I was a bit like, um, uh oh, I didn't think I'd need an epidural, but if this is early labor, yeah. I can't do this for 12 hours. I can't do this. And so I lay down on my side. Um, and I'd said, let's, cause I had the preeclampsia and the help syndrome with my liver. They'd said, your platelets need to be at a certain level if you're going to have an epidural. So I was like, let's do that blood test, check my platelets and get that epidural. <laughs> um, but uh, in the meantime, basically, it turns out I was in transition. Wow. Yeah. And it was very quick labor. Very quick. Yeah. And I was on my side and they said, let's just, after your next contraction, let's have a look if that's okay. And 
I was like, yes, you know, like I don't mind, I guess like the nurses and the doctors, they don't bother me. And I kind of uh, appreciate the information. I know I also appreciate it would be so beautiful to just have an uninterrupted birth experience and not have people looking at you and prodding you and whatever. Um, yeah. But I didn't personally mind. Um, and they said, oh, okay, we can see the head. You've progressed very quickly. <laughs> it's time to push. And my favorite phrase, like through both my births was just go with your body. Mm-hmm. I felt so happy both times when I heard that. Yeah. Um, because my body wanted to go like, um, and the pushing I loved, it was such a strange sensation that I'd never felt before. Um, cause it felt like it started up at my sternum, the push, and I could feel like my whole giant uterus, um, yeah, contracting and pushing. Um, and yeah, the pushing went for a while being the first baby. Um, but I, in those really bad, I would say bad contractions when I was on my side. Yeah. I didn't know where I was up to and I was struggling. I tried my visualization and it basically to me didn't work. I was like, well, abandoned, like too hard. Um, mm-hmm. and I was struggling to breathe properly. And I felt like I was in pain. Mm-hmm. And one of the midwives was holding my hand. She said, just remember every contraction brings you closer to your baby. And I seriously was like, oh, yeah, that's why we're here. I'd forgotten. Like yeah. I was so experiencing pain so much that I'd forgotten my purpose. And um, once I was reminded of that, I really felt like I kind of got back on track. Like the contractions were very, very intense and I would call it painful. Um but still productive. Yeah. Um, but anyway, once I got to the pushing, yeah, I kind of loved it. And I, I had this moment of clarity. I think his head was out or nearly out. And I just was like, all of a sudden, like all good. And I said, mom, how are you going? Are you all right? She's like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> He's like, James, how about you? He's like, yeah, we're fine. <laughs> And they're like, hey, don't worry, don't worry about us. Just like focus on yourself. And I was like, okay, that <laughs> was totally good. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, and then he came out and he was put on me and I he was purple and slimy and um I just was totally confident all of a sudden that everything was okay when he was on me. Yeah. Um, and there was like blood everywhere. I think my cannula had come out and there was blood up my dripping on my arm and it was some <laughs> on my big toe somehow like I don't know but I just like didn't mind at all because I had this little baby on my chest and like I'm so excited just thinking about it right now um wow. yeah it was real like just amazing and I loved it you know in amongst all the blood and the pain and the kind of drama I yeah. felt at the time too like Oh my gosh, I love that. This was the most amazing experience of my life. <laughs> it would be very easy to look at that scene and think it was like a complete shit show, you know, that like a scene out of a horror movie. However, we can never assume what the mother is experiencing. And you were in in amongst the intensity and the, you know, the hard work that you did in a short period of time. A lot of women say, oh, I hope my labor's short. (laughs) Short labors can be very intense and very hard for you to catch your breath. But somehow you were able to stay really centered in that space. Why do you think that is, Jen? Like, what do you think it was that helped you to deal with such an intense experience like that? Um, honestly, also my chemo, I think, because as painful as it was, it is not the worst pain that I've experienced. Yeah. Um, my worst pain was actually when I woke up from uh, a leg surgery, I'd broken my leg and I woke up and wow, that, that was 10 out of 10 pain. Yeah. Um, and this was super intense, but it wasn't the same pain of something's wrong. And I think some people do experience that pain in birth yeah. um, but I, I didn't I still felt like a lot is happening and I don't fully understand but once I understood that I was in transition and my baby was like had was on the move yeah. um, 
you just got I was okay yeah Mm. so I don't know it was like definitely wanting to have that baby out yeah your mindset was just completely working for you not against you to enable you to get through that because another woman could have found that so overwhelming that she could have felt it as quite traumatic so on some level you were able to anchor yourself to just your capacity to get through things which you had a rich history of your it's all about the baby that was a big trigger for you of reminding you of oh I'm nearly it's my baby that we're doing this for um and I imagine the support, people holding space for you, having your mother and your partner there being, you know, holding that space for you to go through that and even yeah. worrying about them towards the end, which is funny. Is, yeah. um, it just, it's all mindset. You put the pieces of your mind and your capacity to get through this in place so you could get through that. That's really is such great wisdom coming from Jen today. I hope you're really appreciating this. So you had your first and then how, how much later, when did you start to um, have another baby? How many, what was the distance between them? Um, I kind of planned it and I was excited about it. Like while I was still on my mat leave, I was like, okay, when um, will I have the next You baby? went on it <laughs> pretty early, did you? You well, were ready. Well, I, was, I was planning, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, but w- the, the gap between them is two and a half years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, what was that pregnancy like? Um, so much better. I wasn't anxious in that same, like on reflection, probably diagnosable way if I'd, you know, if I'd recognized it. Um, but I wasn't anxious like that. I kind of knew that I could do it and that it was real. And like, I was going to have a baby, which I just found it really hard to shift that mindset, um, through my first pregnancy. Um, yeah, we fell pregnant fairly easily again and um I was so excited yeah I was just really excited this time and let myself enjoy it the first time I didn't look at baby clothes for months and months because I just thought this can't be real like it's too good to be true I I can't get excited and then have it go wrong um but this time I would would like buy little baby clothes and I would think about how beautiful my son's gonna be as a brother and um how lovely yeah, I was, when I was at work before I'd told people, I felt like I was carrying around my, my happy little secret, you know, me and my little friend. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was just really lovely. Uh, but I think because I had a toddler and I was at work and you don't get to nap so much <laughs> in the second pregnancy, yeah. um, I didn't give a lot of thought to birth. But I knew that I would use that time when I went on mat leave to prepare again Mm. and so yeah I kind of relaxed through that pregnancy I didn't have preeclampsia this time like I had the same doctor and she said this is a totally different pregnancy for you and I felt so much healthier like I was still exercising and I really felt so much better and realized in retrospect that I had been sick that first time yeah um which was funny because I I think of it so positively the whole thing And I think, you know, I had a great experience, really. Nothing went wrong. Kind of something did go wrong, but it was really manageable. Mm. Um, And so, yeah, when I went on maternity leave, um, I pulled out all my old materials, like my um, calm birth book of the birth stories and um, my, like, sheet that had the stages of labour and how long apart you can expect the contractions. And I was a bit nervous about going into labor, um, as, you know, as a surprise, which I still kind of wanted to do. Um, but given how fast my first birth was, they were basically like, you feel anything you come in because you're going to have that baby <laughs> in like half an hour to two hours. And I live half an hour from the hospital. So, <laughs> um, I was a bit nervous. Um, but I really, this time did even more with the meditations, like, mm-hmm. I listened to a bunch of different ones and um, to the extent that while I was in the labour, I was word for word reciting these things in my mind. Yeah, Uh, (laughs) it was really good. So I ended up being induced again, which I am still not 100% sure that I needed to be. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but ultimately, whatever, I don't mind. I've got my healthy baby and I'm well. Um, uh, the good thing was, though, that I only had my water broken and I didn't have to go on the drip um, okay. because last time its effect had been so dramatic. They were mm-hmm. like, let's just break your waters and probably you'll take it from there. Um, and so, yeah, that's what happened. Ha- however, I guess everybody expected me to have a fast birth including me and I didn't like I didn't really progress like I was having contractions but it was definitely that first stage for a long time a lot of hours and my mum would check in by text and doctors and the midwives would check in and we're all like "Mm, nothing really happening here you know um and I felt like everyone was waiting for me and I do wish that I'd had more kind of confidence and presence to say hey this is my birth suite now mm. I'm gonna take how long I take and you're gonna massage my back and you're gonna get me some water <laughs> you know <laughs> like I wish I had owned it a bit more but I had expected it to just take off and go like last time yeah they can be so different yeah mm. um and I was a real like we had the um oh, I can't remember what it's called Tracy but your you're one like that kind of talks you through the birth where you're preparing yeah and the birth rehearsal yeah the rehearsal we had that one on while I was in there um and played it like over and over because we we're in there for you know many hours waiting for things to really get started but at the same time like my partner was just kind of on his phone and we had put on the tv because we we're like oh might as well just watch some home renos on nine life And yeah, I can't say that I was really in that like spiritual space where I would kind of like to have been um, to really like get in the mindset and Mm. get things going. And so eventually um, I said to my partner, you go off and have like get something for dinner and I'll get in the shower. And basically as soon as I got in the shower, I felt amazing and it was like, just a surge, a total, total shift for my body and my mind. I think because I was alone and I didn't feel the pressure of people waiting for me to give birth. Um, and the water just was warm and amazing. Um, and I had one strong contraction and then right after I had another and I said to myself, oh, no, another one already. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. Oh, yes this is what you wanted. Like you wanted it to progress. So here we are. Let's go. That's so, so fascinating. Women, women on their own, without pressure, without being observed, without, um, you know, the bright lights or the TV, that's, that's the space that promotes the conditions for the right hormonal cocktail to start to, you know, come into play. I, I've been, I remember being at a birth with a woman um, as a doula and she never, um, every time we got close to her, her contractions would stop. Mm. So myself and the midwife, we just had a chat about this and thought, I know what we need to do. And we put her in the bath, in the bathroom, turned off the lights and closed the door mm-hmm. and she was on her own. And we could hear then, we could hear the contractions start to come mm. get fast. So she was super sensitive to people being around her. So it's it's an interesting thing to reflect upon any animal that we're no different to other animals, same thing. When they're being observed, they, they rarely go into labour during the day. They tend to do it more at night when it's dark, when it's intimate, mm. creating those conditions. So you're in the shower starting to have strong contractions. You caught your mind and said, okay, yes, I'm saying yes to this. I'm stepping yeah. to it. How did it unfold from there? Well, may I read your passage from my diary? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'd love to. Like, do. Straight after I... Basically, straight after I got to the ward, I uh, had an opportunity that night to write. And I was like, I'm just going to make some notes before I try to go to sleep. Um, But I I wrote the calm birth meditation guided my entire inner voice slash mental state. I'd played them so many times that I had so many lines to call on. In the shower, I was reciting, let the waves wash over you, under you, through you. 
your body knows how to do this. It was made to do this. I trust my body and I trust my baby over and over again. Wow. And it was, yeah, every contraction. I actually tried, um, like when you said through you, over and under and through, yeah. in my mind, I tried one direction. I can't remember, like maybe say it was forward to back was yeah. the way it went through. And that yeah. was okay. And now I was like, oh, maybe I'll try the other way back to forward. And I was like, no, no, that's no yeah. good. <laughs> just something about it. Wow. Um, I found it really helpful to just be like, yeah, to just kind of let it happen and know that it was really productive, yeah. each one of these. Yeah. And that it this wasn't my life now. Like I wasn't going to be like this forever because, man, it's, it's still hard. Yeah. But it didn't hurt in the way that my first birth strong contractions had yeah um yeah it was so intense by that it really helped so jen's describing the the tracks that you're talking about they're not actually calm birth tracks these are the transform your birth yeah and these are the ones we've done more recently and the labor dance is is a track that we use with just really good messaging that just is peppered through with background music and it sounds like your mind completely took that as this is the operating principle through which we now do birth. So I often laugh with families that I work with that we're brainwashing you. (laughs) And that sounds a bit negative, but actually in a good way, we're washing out the old beliefs and we're giving you thoughts which create feelings, which create images and images and feelings create physiology. And so that's why the body can respond differently. So when we work with the mind and start to take on new ways of thinking and feeling about the whole birth experience, focusing on the baby less, you know, rather than the sensations, but working with the fundamental belief that you can do this. It literally changes the way you experience the whole process. I love that you've brought a lot of this out, Jen, because this is the stuff that's missing in the broader realm of what we see as childbirth education it's the miss the missing the mind component and yet the mind and the body are so intricately connected they are one in the same thing so that's that's really powerful yeah i wish that um some of these i guess like non medical ways of dealing with pain which are actually deployed in some medical circles like childhood cancer they yeah. use meditation and things like that um, yeah, because you right. reach the limit of the drugs that you can give, like you can only give mm. so much before it's harmful. Um, so they do some of these things, but I wish it was standard, like that yeah. everybody could <clears throat> afford to go to a course where they learn mm. these techniques, um, and that their only option isn't epidural. Or I mm. had the gas both times, so like nothing against mm. it, but that you have more things to draw on. Yeah then what do you realise? Because you're right, we're led to go down that pharmacological path thinking that we need it That and why would we put ourselves through it? But what you're describing there not only is is the, the tools and the techniques that you've drawn on, not only is that helping you to manage the, the pain, it's actually bringing your whole body and your whole being into the prime physiological space of not just getting through the birth, but to be ready to parent and to be Mm. ready to meet that baby and to create the milk and to be really ready to respond to the needs of the baby. There's there's very powerful, um, just beautiful things that unlock in the blueprint of creation when we're able to activate the full expression of that hormonal cocktail and that, that blueprint of birth like of what it's meant to be. And I think women know intrinsically whether they're they're able to consciously be aware of it, but there's a feeling in most women that they actually do want to give birth and they want to get through it and they want to see what they're capable of and they Mm. want to feel transformed or Mm. empowered or whatever their language is. And, And they kind of sense this. I've seen it. I've seen... When I prepare women in their pregnancy, talk about this, I feel like I should be able to do it. That's often how they'll they'll say it. 
and of course, you know, sometimes we're able to, you know, all the ducks align or all the stars are in the right place and, and things go without any need for help. And sometimes we need help and we do have to travel different paths like you did for your first birth. Mm. But either way, we kind of know that there's something being unlocked, activated, awakened. These are these are the sort of words. Rhea Dempsey, I've just been listening to, to her talking on a couple of podcasts and she's just done a beautiful book of recent times called Beyond the Birth Plan. And she talks a lot about this as a woman who sat in births, particularly home births, it's where you really see it and you feel it, that there are these storms travelling through the woman's mm. body and, um, you know, and and she's she's literally being transformed through this process and when we can understand that that in birth and and appreciate that you know we've got to respect this we've got to actually bow down mm. to the feet of birth and and respect what what's being welcomed in this space um when we can create those perfect conditions to really help the mother travel path that she has to travel then miracles all sorts of miraculous changes happen inside of her yeah so I'm really I I, I thank you for for sharing that so you did you you really awakened to something quite profound inside of you tell me how that translated when you met your baby and and then into parenting I'm keen to know about that too okay I um oh, just <laughs> during during pushing, I thought to myself, this is the last time you have to do this. I'm not planning any more kids. <laughs> okay. Like, this is it, Jen. I don't know how you thought that you liked birth. Um, but, it, <laughs> you know, like, you just have to get through this and then you don't have to do this again. And literally, I wrote in my diary that night, like, just so I remember, I didn't want to do this again. The next day, I said to James, do you think we should have another baby? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet he wanted to run for the hills at that point. <laughs> well, we had a we had a talk about it, and we came wow. came full circle, and we're like, oh, okay, actually, two's two's right for us. But that's the oxytocin, darling. Yeah, there is no <laughs> achievement like yeah delivering a baby. Man, I just felt yeah. like a goddess, and I thought, how can we have a society that doesn't respect women or motherhood? when this is incredible what people are doing every day mm -hmm. yep yep I just loved it like that <laughs> feeling is like yes I am amazing <laughs> um so like there's definitely a huge high well there was for me after after that and mm -hmm. I think or oh, this baby he just latched so well and he fed right away and again I saw the contrast between my baby delivered you know at 37 weeks to this little guy at 39 um and oh yeah just noticed like how much more alert and how much more developed he was yeah, and ready to land probably mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I found I just found everything so easy and I was amazed like the next day I almost felt normal mm. um of course I was still bleeding and everything but um <laughs> I bumped into a mum that I'd spoken to while I was I'd had my waters broken I was like walking about you know get things moving and I chatted to her she just had a baby and yeah she saw me in the hallway she was like oh, what you just you're like fine what <laughs> what is this I'm so jealous I was like oh it's not like no special skill it's just my second one um but yeah I really feel for the first time mums because man I was a mess that first time like so so hormonal and crying about everything in a happy way mm. um but just crying about everything yeah, and this yeah. time I was really like yep this is great mm. um that's the difference between the synthetic hormone of oxytocin wow. and the real hormone mm. because the synthetic hormone whilst it um, gives us those contractions it doesn't create as many receptors in the body and it takes over the the own the, our own um, oxytocin a little bit more and and so our own oxytocin which gets naturally activated in birth is 
preparing you not just to contract your uterus, but it, it's it, it's a multitasker. It crosses the blood-brain barrier and it lights up all of these reward centers in the brain, getting us ready for this peak moment of meeting our babies, and then and then just helping us to to feel high and and on, ready yeah. because it is yeah. intense those next few days weeks months what was the other most valuable thing about the course i mentioned the stages of labor helped me but also understanding the hormones because we basically since puberty as people joke about hormones like oh she's hormonal Mm. or oh i'm out of control my hormones are in control but actually these hormones grow human beings Mm. and they're very powerful and important and valuable and really being conscious about like don't be overcome by adrenaline Mm. relax and get that oxytocin um flowing so yes so so helpful to be able to consciously think about and understand Mm. um and yeah I'm just in awe of hormones now and I don't think they're funny or embarrassing at all like I think they're amazing and powerful and we should all be kind of Mm -hmm making making use of them throughout our lives like even um when I was feeding when I went home I loved that I I would feel the afterbirth contractions you know when the yeah. uterus is shrinking back down yeah. and I would feel them every time that I started to feed him yeah and I'd be like oh thank you uterus <laughs> you know like you've done such a good job and you're still doing it like still working away and I get to feel good and happy and relaxed and sleepy yeah. Um, while it works away yeah. yeah yeah I love what you're saying about hormones I've I've just kind of I'm on the other side of menopause now so I've had another shift in my hormonal cocktail mm. and and you know menopause gets such a bad rap and I started to notice really which I can now reflect on and understand more and I'm and surprised that we don't have this in our narrative <laughs> I'd have to do um, transform your menopause course mm-hmm. something like that but the first thing I noticed is I got really edgy and angry and impatient and intolerant and then I started to think oh I don't give a fuck anymore <laughs> these are no, these are the don't give a fuck hormones you know <laughs> yeah. then, I, then I started to have hot flushes and I and I, and I started to think Ah, oh, these are power surges. And mm. I started to reframe what hot flushes were. And then they got really, really bad. And then I started to realize that they were connected to my stress levels. Mm. So that caused me to make better decisions about not stressing about stuff and working out what I what's important to me and what isn't. And so it was a bit of a cleaning out. And um, you know, so I, I think we can look at hormonal women and say, Oh, you poor thing. Whereas I, I'm I'm with you on that. I just think, no, 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 look a bit deeper into what's actually going on for that woman and what sort of transformative forces that we talked about earlier are being invoked as well, you know, that the, there's an intelligence to the system. It, mm. it's, it strikes me all the time as I watch more and more and learn more and more, I just worship at the at the feet of mother nature and however Mm. you want to frame that i just think it's an incredible thing that we've forgotten to respect and to you know hold as sacred and and to protect which Mm. is what we need to do so what a conversation jen we've covered some pretty big stuff i always like to ask people what did what have you learned about yourself and what would you tell a pregnant woman have you got an answer for that oh I guess, gosh, no, about myself, I'm really just, I feel like a little more in touch with some form of spirituality, which Mm. I've never felt before. Um, And I'm really interested in where it might take me um, Mm. or what I will, you know, explore or learn next. And for pregnant women, gosh, there's so much, like I just want to, talk about pregnancy and birth all the time (laughs) everyone's going to have you know a different experience and be open to different ideas but um I would always recommend some kind of some kind of like you know hypnobirthing Um, birthing transform your birth birth. Mm. um something to open your mind to the possibility that birth is going to be 
an amazing experience, not an experience to fear or dread or just get through because it can be so much more than that. Mm. Mm. Well said. I'm a great believer in any program that works with the mind because that's where we hold the baggage. It's where we hold the stuff that we can walk in to a labour room with that can get in the way of us really being able to work with the process of birth, not against it. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you today for taking us to areas in this podcast that I want to explore more, particularly after listening to Rhea Dempsey talk. Um, it's, It's something that we're just not acknowledging medically that there's a much bigger thing going on than just a uterus spitting out a piece of meat. <laughs> yeah. Pretty harsh way of saying it, but sometimes I think that's what we think we're doing in hospitals and when we medicalize birth that we're just focusing on the physiology of it and not what's attached to the mm. uterus, which is a woman, a fully mm. formed soul and spirit, and she's giving birth to a human soul as well. And there are things going on there that we don't really talk about. And I feel like this conversation took us to that place today. So I really appreciate you sharing your great wisdom that's come Mm -hmm. from birthing your two gorgeous children. And um, yeah, thanks, Jen, for being here. It's really good having you. Yeah, thanks so much for giving me an opportunity to chat to you, who I've heard so much in my Mm -hmm you know, in my phone speaker (laughs) (laughs) and to yeah talk about birth. I hope I've, you know, I hope I've said the things that I've meant to say um, Mm -hmm. because I feel like there's a million things I want to talk about. (laughs) You have to write some stuff. People who are interested. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's a real, it's a really sacred area of life and I want to do my best to keep these ideas floating through people and helping them to understand that there are things you can do to learn, to create inside of you and to prepare when it comes to welcoming your beautiful babies. So thanks for listening and we'll see you again next week. Bye. This episode has been brought to you by Transform Parenting, an organisation that provides courses, coaching and community from pregnancy through to the first seven years of a child's life. It is a place where you can learn, get support and grow into your role as a parent. Our Transform Your Birth course, both in Canberra and online, is waiting for you to feel calmer and more confident to give birth and change the way you labour. Or why not watch our free masterclass on Keeping Relaxed and Excited About Birth, where we discuss the three most important things that can change a birth. You'll find us at our website on www.transformparenting.com.au.